Hey, everyone, and thank you for tuning in again. Today is Sunday, June 11th. It is 1 p.m., and you are currently watching the Skill Building Sunday Drawing Group here live on the Reinventing the Tattoo Network. Uh, my name is Jason Leeser. I'm going to be your host for today. And if this is working for you, please drop us a comment. Let us know so that that way I'm not exactly talking to like dead air or anything, because that's kind of awkward. And welcome to Guy Aitchison's Reinventing the Tattoo Community, where tattooers, apprentices, collectors, and the curious are encouraged to join in these live streams, real world events, to share and inspire and ultimately create better art and tattoos together. We beam out nearly every day and with your help have evolved into a quality network of amazing live and on-demand tattoo and art shows that have all been receiving rave reviews. You can find Reinventing the Tattoo in both of the app stores, the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, as well as our Reinventing the Tattoo YouTube, uh, our Reinventing the Tattoo Roku channel, which has 12 to 15 episodes playing at any given time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, accessible on all Roku-enabled devices, including some smart TVs, as well as all of the major podcast directories, such as Apple and Spotify. Um, or you can do what most people do and just do a Google search for Reinventing the Tattoo. And you'll find it all, except for the book. The book is out of print. I've been searching for a copy for a while. If you come across a copy, please let me know because I would like to purchase it. But no matter where you are watching live or on demand, you can always get the latest, most up-to-date information all available at www.reinventingthetattoo.com. You can try it out for free. Um, you can pick one of three options. We've got a sample webinar from the Reinventing the Tattoo Canon. You've got some advice from Guy Aitchison about your unique goals. Or you can choose a comprehensive tattoo history course from Jay Brown, which is absolutely awesome. Love that course. You can also find a full event schedule with full weekly and special event live stream details as well as access to our Reinventing 24-7 channel, which is a lot like our Roku channel. It's got about 13 different episodes playing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and that's available on all web-enabled devices. Once again, accessible through www.reinventingthetattoo.com. At reinventingthetattoo.com, you also have access to a whole bunch of professional development courses uh, pay for on-demand pay-per-view seminars from over 20 world-class tattooers, and that's growing. Um, we've got a few more people lined up that will be doing uh, paid for webinars. Um, so if you're interested, keep up to date, keep checking back, and um, maybe you'll come across something you'll like that could be a game changer for you. If this is working for you again, please let us know in the comments and in the chats, and please, Tag a friend who loves tattoos. Uh, maybe it's someone looking to get their first tattoo or someone trying to become a tattoo artist. Uh, maybe it's someone that's curious about, you know, what we do day in and day out. Never really know, but if they have any interest in tattoos, tag them in the broadcast. Um, we're always looking to get more people involved in this show. Speaking of shows, we've got a number of weekly staple shows we always encourage people to tune into. Starting on Sundays at 1 p.m. with me, Jason Leeser, for the Skill Building Sunday Drawing Group. And that's followed on Monday with three separate shows. On Monday at 9 a.m., we have Drawing Four Tattooers with James Wisdom, where we go through and discuss, you know, basic fundamental drawing techniques and strategies, you know, the real core root of how we draw things and a lot of the stuff that they teach in art schools. Um, Following that, on Mondays at 5 p.m., we have Let's Talk About Feelings with Robbie Ripple, where we go through and we get to talk about some of those lesser discussed topics about how do we feel about things. Um, something being a tattoo artist, we don't always really open up that well about, so this gives us an outlet for that. Following that, capping off Monday night at 9 p.m., we have a subscribers exclusive drawing group with Sandy McAndrew. Um, and that is at 9 p.m. And that is only available to people that have a subscription to either the Reinventing the Tattoo Canon or the Reinventing the Tattoo Evolution course. I can tell you from personal experience that these Monday night classes 
where everyone gets together virtually and we all try to focus on something that's outlined in the reinventing the tattoo canon whether it's uh, focus or contrast or um, we even did a, a virtual uh, digital tattoo class one night um, where we got a whole bunch of different brush sets together and, you know, tried to do like a virtual tattoo using virtual brush sets. Pretty fun. Um, but that's only available to people that have these subscriptions. So if you're interested in doing that, I'll tell you it's that alone is worth the price. Um, it's absolutely 100% one of the most valuable things I ever invested in. Um, speaking of investing, I'd like to take a quick second to thank some of our sponsors and some of the people that make these shows happen. Starting with worldtattooevents.com, the largest, most comprehensive resource for tattoo events worldwide. As we know, living in this post-pandemic era, uh, certain tattoo conventions and events are still getting rescheduled every now and then. So if you want the latest, most up-to-date information on a tattoo event coming to a city or town near you, or maybe it's one you want to visit, who knows? Uh, maybe you want to take vacation and you want to go and check out a convention in another country or another area of your country. This is the place to go to do it. Um, they literally have a worldwide listing of tattoo conventions and events coming up. Uh, you can't go wrong with it. Following worldtattooevents.com, we have tattoonow.com, technology for tattooers, the leading edge in professional development, management, and digital tools for tattoo artists of all levels. They're constantly keeping everything upgraded and updated. They are competitive with any type of CRM and mailing list or scheduling software out there. So if you're really looking for the digital tools to go through and get the people to come in that want to get the work that you want to do, this is the way to do it. TattooNow.com has been in business for a long, long time, and they are one of the most trusted names in the industry for any type of digital tools that you can imagine. And of course, this wouldn't be reinventing the tattoo without a very personal and professional thank you and shout out to Guy Aitchison at GuyAitchison.com. He is the founder and inspiration behind Reinventing the Tattoo. Go to GuyHSN.com where you can pick up a copy of his Biomech Encyclopedia, uh, some of his DVDs. He's got some custom coil machines for sale, countless fine art prints. Um, and every now and then you can catch him selling an original painting on there. All available at GuyHSN.com. Would also like to go through and take a very quick second to say thank you to some of our affiliates. Uh, the Apprenticeship Diaries with Amy Nichols. If you are trying to become a tattoo apprentice or if you are looking for more information about tattoo apprenticeships, maybe what's entailed, maybe you're trying to figure out like, are they really as bad as people have said that they are? Take a look at the Apprenticeship Diaries with Amy Nichols. Um, she goes through and interviews tons of different people in different industries and kind of talks about their apprenticeship experience uh, you can get a lot of absolutely valuable information all from this podcast. Highly recommend you check it out. Um, and that is the Apprenticeship Diaries. Would also like to say a very personal thank you to Aaron Williams, the mad scientist, and TATCOM. Uh, TATCOM is currently creating some of the most innovative uh, tattoo tools for the everyday tattooer. When I say tattoo tools, I mean like power supplies. Um, I think they're working on some new machines now that really go through and allow us to tattoo in a more efficient and better manner than ever before, right? These guys are literally pioneering the field in tattoo science. Um, they're diving into how tattoos get made and what makes them work and all types of other stuff from a scientific perspective. Take a look at TATCOM for the most up-to-date and the latest and greatest tattoo equipment innovations that you could ever possibly imagine. As always, if you like today's show, make sure to go through and hit that like and subscribe button down at the bottom of the page. And feel free to post a positive review on the channel and help us get the word out. Um, also, if you have any comments about today's show, feel free to drop those down there as well. 
Uh, we're always looking for new suggestions and comments and different things that we can do to help improve these shows. So please, by all means, go through and drop us a message. If you would like to host a Reinventing the Tattoo event, become a sponsor of our community, or if you are looking for a fine art or a tattoo critique, please email management at reinventingthetattoo.com and we will get back to you just as soon as we can. That kind of wraps up our intro for today. I think there was someone that was trying to join us. Maybe not. Um, I know I was talking to Seth Mushrush earlier today. Um, Seth is a regular here on the Reinventing the Tattoo Network. Um, great guy, phenomenal artist. And he wanted me to share a couple of things with everyone um, and just kind of show people what he's been working on lately. Um, let's see if we can bring some of those up. Uh, Seth has been working on a whole bunch of new stuff. Uh, let's see, share screen here. But, nope, there we go. So this is um, one of the many new projects Seth has been uh, working on. Uh, it's a color dog portrait, obviously. Um, take a look at some of the values and some of the quality that's in there. And this, I do believe, is fully healed. So if you're looking for someone that does outrageously amazing color portraits, uh, you're definitely going to want to look this guy up. He is Seth Mushrush at Seth Mushrush Art. Um, and not only does he do color portraits, that's a better shot of it. I mean, look at the depth in that thing. All the tiny little hairs that are in there. That is a nice dog. He's also been working on a couple of pretty big cover-ups. Um, this is just an example of one of the ones he's working on. Uh, look at that dragon. Oh, that is, the flow in that is awesome. Absolutely awesome. Look at that stencil. Oof. So that is some of the new work by Seth. Uh, oh, speaking of which, here it comes. Awesome. Great. Seth is in here. Seth is in the house. And he should be unmuting in just a second. I think he said he was driving today, so uh, let's be a little bit patient with that. What's up, guys? What's up, Seth? How's it going, What's man? Going that on? was a killer dragon back piece, man. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. It was a uh, client was definitely uh, dedicated to get the ball rolling, so it was nice to do two days in a row. Yeah, man, two days Rock in a row up. is tough for anyone. I know I've yeah. done it, and it is not very fun. No, it's definitely not easy. I mean, we do pay management the best we can, um, but uh, he uh, he was a baller for sure. He he went for it, and um, he had a dragon back piece started from somebody, uh, and just was, unfortunately really wasn't happy with it. He got some other work from this guy, and it was the other stuff that he got thought was pretty good. And then uh, the back piece, he said he was about you know a quarter of the way through starting it and just immediately was like put the brakes on and I was tattooing a buddy of his it's like oh you should take a look at it it's one of those situations where you know covering you know an object with the same object but just bigger you know same subject matter um, that was the best way to go about it you know was you know going large like that just trying to eliminate any of the attention that goes to where that other tattoo was yeah, it kind of goes back to the old adage of, um, you know, one of the secrets to cover ups that I was always taught when I was coming up was, um, you know, break up the image, you know, try to do everything you can to break that image up to the best of your ability so that yeah. that way you can go through and kind of distract the eye from what's underneath it. Yeah, yeah, it's all about moving the center of attention away from the cover up. I mean, you can sometimes get away from it 
or get away with it. You know, if it's a very light tattoo. I mean, working with uh, Goldberg, I've seen seen him take the approach, and it, it'd be very, very successful sometimes where somebody's got a bunch of stuff that you're covering and you're having a tough time figuring out how to go about it. But whatever subject matter you have is dynamic in nature and, you know, or has a lot of, uh, a lot of different lines or textures or something to it. His approach is just tattoo it like the old one's not even there. Just, you know, go for it. Sometimes that works too. You know, like I think it's, it's all relative to the, the particular cover up. It's one of those tricky things where you, you know, you're always starting off with a certain amount of boundaries that you have to work within. But um, it, depending on how light that tattoo is, how large it is, if there's color or not, I think one of the hardest things to cover is like a well-done name or an outline of another tattoo because it it's there's no filler in it. It's just all this open, wide open space with black lines running this way yep. and that way. You know, that's it can be that can be really really tricky. I, rem- I won't ever forget, I was working at um, a small studio a number of years ago, and we actually had a guy come in, and he had a name on his neck, and he actually wanted the name covered up with a different name. Oof. Yeah. It's not possible, right? Like I, It was not. I think what we ended up yeah. doing was covering the, the existing name with like a rose, and then putting the other name below that, so just to kind of help, you know, break everything up and make it a more successful cover up. Um, but it was one of those things where it's like, you yeah. want me to do what? Yeah, it seems like that's the approach. Yeah, but yeah. you know, uh, sometimes you get like weird requests. Really yeah, absolutely. You know, we're we're uh, that's the one thing about what we do is that you're uh, you know you're always. Uh, we're hired guns, man. We're, we're illustrators. You know, it'd be great to do what we wanted to do all of the time, but that's not to say that that doesn't lend itself well to our own creativity. You know, I mean, I, some of the, the most fun tattoos I've ever done, I never would have thought of doing on my own. People right. just are like, hey, I want I want these things doing X, Y, Z, and I'm oh, shit. All right, that's a great idea. Yeah, it's like, absolutely. Let's that. Let's do that. Yeah. You know, every now and then. That you know, dragon you're working on looks really good, man. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out some things. You know, um, I, I know during the last episode, I went through and was kind of talking about upper arms a little bit um, and how I generally try to map those out. Um, now I've been working on like lower legs of dragons for like full body dragons. Um, yeah. Don't get me wrong, if at all possible. I always usually like to try to go through and do like just the upper half. You know, I just find it to be more dynamic and a lot less busy. Um, And unless someone's really trying to get a very substantially sized dragon, I try not to do a whole body just because getting all the scales in there and then you have the back ridge line, then you have all the tiny little claws and then you got to make the head a lot smaller, you know, so it kind of takes away from the elegance of you know a full body dragon um yeah but i like to give people the option you know sometimes it can be a good challenge you know yeah um and i was i've always struggled with like back legs on dragons Uh, and then i remember listening to someone say when in doubt try to find something in nature like some an animal that exists if you're struggling with an animal anatomy or you know try to find a texture or like a reference image of something that currently exists that has the same base structure and then go based off of that and what you come up with so and that's when i started really looking at a lot of anatomy right and at first i was like oh an iguana right okay cool perfect lizard legs cool what do those look like and i started looking at that and they their front and hind legs tend to look pretty similar and i was like that's not really the kind of shape i'm going for and i kept thinking and i was like oh canines okay canines legs kind of have like the generalized shape and structure that i was looking for um you know okay cool 
what else has that kind of a similar hind leg structure, right? Then I was thinking about horses. Horses have very defined hind legs um, and they've got kind of the structure, the base underlying structure that I was really looking at. Um, yeah. You know, and just expanding on that. So, you know, I, I was very fortunate. Um, I was struggling with working on a hind leg and my girlfriend happened to be sitting next to me and I asked her, she's got some experience in the field of dealing with different animals. And uh, so I asked her like, hey, can, can you help me out with some anatomy? And we sat down and we talked about, you know, muscle structures and joints and, um, you know, stuff like that. And um, it, it led me to really start looking at, you know, more like hind quarter legs and the way that those are structured on horses. Uh, yeah. And you know what, man, they are, I actually pulled up, let's see. So these are just some sketches I randomly pulled up off of Pinterest of like horses and their leg structures. Um, yeah. And you can kind of see, you know, in, in essence, how you could very easily structure a dragon's leg off of something like this. A hundred percent, especially that one in the lower left there. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Yeah, any of these could really work well uh, as far as like your perspective goes. So it's, you know, once again, it's something that I always try to circle back to is, you know, if myth mythical creatures do not exist, well, not that I know of at least. If you know where I can find an actual dragon, please let me know. Um, I'd love to see one in person, right? But dragons were often kind of mimicked or constructed based on body parts of different, like, actual animals. Um, you know, back in the old school days, they used to say, oh, if you want to draw a dragon's head, just study a camel's head, right? It's got the same base structure. Or study a, uh, a caiman or an alligator or a crocodile. You know, those, those are going to have a lot of the same base structures that you would find in a dragon's head. Sure. Um, you know, so mythical creatures for the longest time have always kind of been constructed based off of existing animals. So if you ever come across something where you're struggling to like try to figure out how to draw something or like, you know, something's just not turning out the way that you thought it would, um, Go back through, start to try to find animals that have the existing kind of structure that you're looking for in their existing anatomy. And it is a life saver. Yeah. You know, and it can also help you understand things a bit better as far as, you know, um, you know, just muscle structure joints. Sure. Where do joints exist and how would joints move? Um, yeah, you know, so it's, it's just something that I'm constantly trying to get better at is different types of anatomy. So I'm, I'm always down for other ideas and input and other concepts. Um, you know, I've even looked at like bird legs and how to, how are those constructed, right? Um, looking at like chicken legs and stuff like that, rooster legs. There, I was just going to say, uh, a, pardon me for interrupting, but just on that, that subject, um, ostriches. Oh, that's a good uh, one. They're good because they're big and muscular, like the horse leg, but you get like that kind of spindly lower half, more like a dragon. And then their lower half is actually plated and, the, you know, three toes, just, you know, just like a dragon. They got all the scales on them and um, little claws on the end of them. So something that's, to keep in mind a really good idea. I didn't even think about looking at an ostrich. It's funny though, because ostriches are one of those animals. It's like, it's just a stupid side note, but they always look like they should be wearing pants and they forgot to put them on. Yep. Right. They're completely Could naked not agree on the lower half. Yeah. They're ridiculous, but that's why they make good, you know, good uh, structure for a dragon because you can see all of that. Much like you can with the horses, everything's kind of right there. 
you know, the only difference really being is the lower half where the, the call and the talents are, I suppose. Yeah, yeah I like that cascading body, like coming forward in the forward space. I, I, it's always good to see people drawing dragons like that, you know, that dynamic type of movement where it's moving. You know, you have to remember that the page is, although the page is flat, the space that the dragon exists in is not, you know, it can go right. way off into the distance and come all the way forward and back again. It's not just zigzag back and forth. Well, and I also like to try to keep a little bit of like a repetition, like a pattern in there as well. Um, yeah. I spent a number of years studying snakes and snake bodies and, you know, how do they move in space? And I, I remember reading a book. Um, I think it was written by a guy named Kevin Stress. Uh, was I think it was the year of the snake where he said, you know, to really make your snakes a lot more dynamic. Um, remember, they're moving back and forth in space as well as, you know, side to side. And when yeah. you start to think of that, think of whatever surface you're drawing on is three dimensional, you start to try to map out like, okay, how can I get this to move backwards and forwards to create that illusion of depth in space? Um, yeah. And I always like to try to keep things pretty balanced. Um, and by balance, what I mean is, let me switch this up so you can see what I'm sketching. Um, so here, if we have the head, which I want to be like, you know, the most in the foreground, the highest contrast. I really want to put a lot more emphasis on that. I'm going to use that as my starting point for yeah. what I want to be the furthest forward. And then I'm going to go back a layer, right? So this would be layer number two, right? Elevation two. Elevation two is going to go back to elevation three, right? Elevation three is going to come forward again um to elevation two yeah and this is going to come down to elevation one which is the head right yeah and then this is going to go to literally zero go back to one go back to two and then go back to three right nice. so so i'm really trying down. to utilize a whole bunch of different varying levels of depth um, and there's part of the reason why is because I never really know how to end a dragon's tail. Like, I, I'll be honest about that. I really don't know how to do that. So I always just kind of blur it out at the end and just do a very vague, soft kind of shape. Um, and if you've got something moving that far back in space, it makes it very easy to go through and just be like, oh. This is further back, so it's just going to be a nice, soft kind of shadowed area. The uh, trick I learned with, with the tails are uh, just when you think the end of the tail is like long enough, stretch it out another couple of inches. You think? Or whatever. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because then it, what it does is it forces you to like think about it like the end of a whip, right? Like you, you have the, the the whip is, you know, like Indiana Jones, right? Like you get all that body and mass on the, the top half of the whip and the end just kind of does its own little like flippy thing. Like it flips back on itself a lot um, as opposed to just having it kind of tail off like, you know, like a, like a ribbon that, um, you know, like a dancer would use, like a gymnast, like that type of ribbon. They, they move like that, but they got weight to it. Right. Like, right. so it'll often be flipped back on itself or curled around and basically doing with it what you're already doing with the body of the dragon to begin with, you know. That makes sense. It's, yeah. Yeah. Like, you can have that dip back behind itself and then come over that little hump you have on the bottom where it's, it's scaling down and going into the tail, you know, goes behind itself under the leg and then back through the front again. Um, but yeah, just like a, you know, like a piece of taffy, you're stretching the taffy, like it gets thinner and thinner and longer. And I, I mean, I, there's no right or wrong way, really. Like as long as you're following all of the other types of formulas, I think, you know, tails and things like that, you know, maybe the shape of certain claws, as long as the structure is proper, that's where you, you're able to start talking slang, right? Like visually, you can start kind of putting your own flavor into it. 
do right. it. However, I mean, there's a multitude of some people have them curl back on themselves and make a little knot, like a little nubby. You know what I mean? On the oh, end. yeah. So I've seen That's a good tails, idea. The, the long tails, the nubby tails, spiky tails. And, you know, nothing wrong even like that. Like the traditional, those just spike, uh, spikes fanning out. All that stuff. Yeah, one one guy's work that I'm constantly looking at for references, and I'll I just pulled this off of Pinterest earlier this morning. Uh, this was drawn by an artist named Tony Hu, um, up at Chronic Inc. in Canada, and um, I absolutely love his work. Uh, I he used to have some video seminars out a while back called a Dragon Masterclass, and um, I learned so much from that class on dragons, it was absolutely ridiculous. Oh, I bet. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't think those videos are still available. I know the website kind of got shut down. Masterclass got shut down? Uh, Tattoo Masterclass. Which, okay. don't, don't get that confused with a lot of the other ones that are out there with like Julian Siebert um, and a whole bunch of those guys. Those are a very different uh, type of class. These okay. were more focused on drawing. Um, Elliot Wells did one on peonies. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, Elliot's great. Yeah, yeah. And he broke down all of his like little tricks and secrets and, you know, how he does like those, the like gold outlines around some of them without really using a black outline. Um, it was phenomenal yeah. classes. Uh, he did one on koi, one on dragons. Um, he did one on Tony who did one on Hanya's Hanya masks, yeah. but I don't think okay. that one ever got released to the public. Um, but I, I was able to go through and um, I, I think I actually still have them saved somewhere on a hard drive, but they, they were absolutely phenomenal with, and he took you through hours for everything you wanted to learn how to draw claws he would take you through and he had an entire 30 minute segment just on drawing claws right wow. and he had he broke down the face into different planes and he would he would spend 15 minutes working on just whiskers right yeah. or just the brow line with the eyes or just the nose or just the mouth um then he did one on the whole body and how he did scales and you know, how he did body positioning and stuff like that. Um, so it was absolutely priceless information um, that I'm very happy I got to capitalize on while it was still available. Uh, if anyone out there knows Tony personally that's watching, um, tell him I said thank you. Because he has had a profound impact on the way that I draw a lot of stuff. Yeah, I, will, I, I stumbled across that that website a few years back and was just completely blown away with everything. I was like, oh, shit, this is what I needed. Where has this nice. been? Now I have to draw this, which is like. What was that? Is it just you and I on right now? Yep. Yep. No one else has uh, joined in today, which okay. stinks. There was someone trying to join in earlier. I just couldn't get to him in time. I was in the middle of doing the intro. Okay. Yeah. So it's just us for now. No, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I mean, it's always good um, to have a bunch of people on, but I, I love talking with you and, and, you know, putting this stuff out there to begin with. So. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, it, it once again, it, it all comes back to once you've achieved and learned so much, it then becomes your responsibility to give back to the community. You know, it's just, it's kind of the way that I was brought up and the way that I was raised, you know, in the tattoo world. Um, yeah. You know, once you, once you've learned so much, pass that knowledge on. Don't be yeah. a gatekeeper. Don't you know, go back through and say, oh, these are my secrets. This is, you know, this is my money, you know, blah, blah, yeah. blah. That's the Don't old that. school way of doing it. Yeah. 
How, how is this industry supposed to evolve and get better by anyone if we keep all of that knowledge to ourselves? Yeah. You know, and at the same time, you know, I understand, like, obviously don't just, like, give it away. Make sure it goes to people that have earned the right to know it. But share. Share that yeah. knowledge. Yeah. Absolutely. I think you're be a, a full nod to you know what I mean you don't have to go real far out of your way but when somebody shows interest and they want to spark that conversation and talk about those things that you know you should do it because you know we're all at a point in our career where somebody shared that information with us or maybe we had to seek it out on our own and we thought boy it would have been a lot easier if so and so just you know had this conversation with me about applause or whatever yeah, absolutely. No, I'm actually searching for something right now. I was uh, very fortunate um, while I was out on vacation to go out and actually visit a very, very traditional tattoo artist um, out in Europe. Uh, he's one of the remaining people, one of the remaining original members of the Bristol Tattoo Society. Um and I can't seem to find his card anywhere. Otherwise, I was going to show that to you. Uh, but his name is, and I could be completely and totally butchering the pronunciation of the last name. If you were watching, I apologize. But um, Hank Schiffmacher, I, I think that's the way you pronounce it. Uh, okay. One of the remaining living legends of the Bristol Tattoo Society. And I was fortunate enough to get a tiny little tattoo done by him while I was out there. And it was, I, I was as giddy as a schoolboy. It was great. Nice. What did you get? Uh, oh, no problem, Jerry. Hope you're doing well. Um, I got a little windmill, a little Dutch windmill uh, for being out in uh, Amsterdam. Wanted something to kind of commemorate the trip as I usually cool. like to do with uh, a lot of the tattoos that I get done. I like to have a story behind them. Cool. So those are kind of roughed in. Let's shrink this down a bit. Now we can start refining. And before we refine, we go back through make sure I have my belly scale layout kind of body positioning kind of roughed in. Otherwise things tend to overlap and end up being in spots that they shouldn't. Is this for a tattoo or just a drawing? Uh, yes. So this tattoo is a bit away. Um, I booked the appointment. I believe it's in September at some point. Okay, it cool. Actually works well for the uh, seminar that I would like to take from Bill Canales, who will actually be out in my area uh, in August. So we'll see how that goes. Um, hopefully I can take some of what I learned there and apply that to this tattoo. But, you know, yeah. I don't ever really like to get, you know, too far into planning that kind of stuff especially because I'm still paying off this uh, this trip that I just took. So we'll see how finances go. go. Uh, Amsterdam. Oh, that was the trip to Amsterdam. Awesome. Yes. Yes. Wow, and it rad. was, it was incredible. Good um, deal. Man. Yeah. I got to see a lot of great art, uh, a lot of great museums, um, you know, did a lot of walking. My legs are still kind of sore from it. Uh, averaging, you know, six, seven miles a day, which doesn't sound like a lot to most people, but to someone like me that doesn't really uh, get out and walk quite so much, um, it, it was a bit more than I was used to. So, but it was an absolutely wonderful time. Um, and I would highly recommend it to anyone out there. I would just say, what, however much money you think you have for it, bring more because it's a bit more expensive than I thought. A little more than I thought. 
more expensive. Okay. Yeah, but you know, it's it was an absolutely wonderful time, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. So, what's uh, something that stands out to you artistically from that trip besides you meeting up with Schumacher and I? Um, a lot of the, a lot of the old um, Dutch master paintings um, were kind of either mimicked and uh, done up in different restaurants as like frescoes. Uh, which were absolutely amazing. You know, uh, Jerry, absolutely. Hanky Panky. Uh, Hanky Panky was the name of the studio that Hank worked at uh, for many, many years. And then he actually, within the last couple of years, left and relocated, and he's got a different studio now. Um, wow. But absolutely legendary tattooer. Um, a lot of people have that are very influential that I know of have actually gotten tattooed by him. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal human. Um, but yeah, uh, sorry to get off track there. Uh, no, but a sorry. lot of, imagine sitting in a restaurant eating dinner or having breakfast and staring at a, obviously it's not original and it's not, you know, a real, say Vermeer, but um you know, they had a lot of just amazing frescoes on the walls in just random restaurants that you would go to. And I just absolutely loved that because you were surrounded by art everywhere. Um, yeah, hell yeah. So it, it was awesome. That and the architecture, um, just walking around, looking at the different styles of architecture that were there. Sure. Um, uh, I was kind of concerned. Some of the buildings looked like they were getting ready to fall down. Um, they were <laughs> leaning to quite a degree. Uh, I want to say probably 15 degrees or so, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is when you're looking at it and you're like, why does that look like it's falling forward onto me? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so, I mean, the architecture was great, though. Um, all of the museums I went to uh, were phenomenal. Highly recommend the trip to anyone out there. And not just because it's basically European Sin City, uh, where any vice you can imagine is available. Um, yeah. But because of like the history that's there, you know, and how it was such a, at one point in time, um, you know, Amsterdam and the Netherlands and Holland were all a, it was all like the biggest melting pot in Europe of European cultures in the world during a very specific time period. So yeah. you get influences from Italian Renaissance, you get influences from, you know, all of these other cultures, you know, that are all there and you can see like through some of the columns on some of the buildings you can see like the the roman and greek influences on some of their architecture you can see um you know some of the reflections of artists like van gogh because he has, he has all the museum there um and rembrandt everywhere you know uh so it's amazing uh, highly recommend the trip to anyone that is looking to go somewhere and get away for a while. Um, it does get a bit wild on Friday and Saturday nights. Not going to lie. Uh, oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's because it is kind of like the Las Vegas of Europe. Uh, you get a lot of bachelor parties and a lot of bachelorette parties that are there on Friday and Saturdays. And um, they can get a little, a little spicy sometimes. Um but you know it's a great time. Highly recommend it. Good. So when is that Bill Canales uh, event in August? Um, so that would be coming up. I know it's in the beginning of August, and I'm not trying to give out too many details about it because I don't okay. know how big it's. Uh, going I think you be. mentioned it to me before. Yeah. I uh, may be. Uh, yeah, that may be a week, the, a weekend, or something that I'm not around. Yeah, I believe it's going to be like the first or second weekend in August. Um, okay. I'll get you all of the information on that and all of the details on that. Um, yeah, I think you sent it to me. I just don't have it, right? Uh, yeah, well, I should be getting the outside. communique from Bill about some of the event details. Um, okay. 
he said he was going to be sending it out today at some point. So we'll see what, what happens with that. Um, Sweet. You know, just because as of right now, I don't even know the full details. So I can't really say too much. Yeah, you can't speak for something you don't know. Exactly. You know, and I don't want to sit here and be like, oh, it's going to be this date and time and all this other stuff at you know, this location when I, I don't know. Um, yeah. I can speculate, but I don't know for certain, so I'm not really trying to say too much. Okay. Um, but if that does go down, it's going to be absolutely amazing to be like, you know, on hand for that kind of a seminar. For um, sure. I've been following Bill's career since I met him back in 2016 or 17, I think. Um, uh, I met him at the London Tattoo Convention. I was there getting my, or I was there, I had just gotten my knee done by Fibs like a couple of months prior to that. And I okay. had an appointment lined up with Clint Danroth that Sunday. But, you know, I walked around the floor with Fibs and he kind of gave me some introductions to a lot of people. One of them was nice. Bill. And I just remember watching him knock out this like freehand sleeve onto a chest plate. And it was just a whole new level. It was a whole new experience. Yeah, and, uh, he's great at carving those images out of uh, people's uh, body parts and stuff, just making it look like they they so belong there. Great. Well, and it, the thing that I really like about Bill's um, like specific and unique style is that it's simplistic but because of its simplicity, it's actually very complex. Sure. You know, because he's using a lot of different simple elements to create these narratives and these scenes, whether it's just clouds, whether it's, you know, regardless of whatever background imagery he uses to kind of tie things together, he's keeping things very much on the simplistic side as far as his composition goes. You know, yeah. he's following very simple line, visual lines of interest. Um, and it works really, really well for what he does. Uh, I always call him the Dragon King because, like, to me, that's one Fair. of the things he is. Um, yeah. You know, he's just someone that I've always been completely enamored by, so... Yeah, totally highly agree. recommend. Uh, if you guys don't know who Bill Canales is, he's out of San Diego at Full Circle Tattoo. Um, and if you like Japanese dragons and Asian dragons in any aspect, this guy is absolutely crushing it. Um, highly recommend you take a look at his work. So, um, uh, so Jerry just made a comment on the YouTube, just got a used Dan Kubin V3 today. Any thoughts on them? Um, but the V3 specifically had me curious to ask. Um, so I've been tattooed by one of them and um, they can pack a punch. Um, Those are the flights, right? V2 flights or whatever. Uh, the Dan Kubins? Yeah. Is that the same? Am I thinking of the same I, I'm shape? not sure if it's the same thing as the flight. I know he does a lot of different versions. It might be the side cranker because he had multiple versions of that come out or the side okay. winder. Um, yeah. Those, all of Dan Kubin's machines pack a punch. They do. Yeah. Um, they pack a punch to the point that, like, I don't want to say it's excessive because it's not. But anything that you go to put in is going to be like butter. Uh, it's just going to be oh, so. Well, yeah. Um, I myself haven't had the opportunity to use one because I'm more or less wireless. So I don't really, you know, mess with like power supplies or anything like that anymore. Um, right. But for those people out there that still, you know, work in that kind of a methodology. They are fantastic machines. Keep them maintenance. Don't mess with them too much. And you will be just fine. Um, but that kind of goes with like any type of machine, right? Even though yeah. 
traditional coils, it's like, you know, the, the reason why a lot of people used to go through and say, oh, well, these machines are crap or junk or whatever. It's because they kept messing with, them. you know, and yeah. they're like, oh, well, it doesn't run the way that I want it to run. And it's like, well, then trade it out and get something that does. Right. But don't mess with it. Because the second you mess with it, you don't know the ins and the outs of that specific machine. Yeah. And if you don't know that specific machine, if you didn't build it by hand, don't mess with it. Yeah, I agree. You know, leave it be or send it back to the builder and be like, hey, can you make this run for small liner groupings? Can you build this for, you know, super soft black and gray shading? Yeah. Um, you know, and they will tune it and they will make sure that everything is perfect just for what it is you're trying to do. You know, so let them do it. That's what they do. That is who they are. And that is how they make a living. You know, as much as I agree that, yeah, you should know exactly how you want a machine to run and how you want it to feel if you're trying to execute, you know, a super soft black and gray portrait or, uh, you know, a super bold neo trad piece. Um, yeah. You know, which very different styles and very different types of machine feel. But, you know, that's make sure that you have a machine that's going to do what you want it to do in accordance with your own hand speed, in accordance with, you know, what that machine is meant to do. Yeah. Yeah. They got to be reliable. Yeah. And efficient. Yeah. For sure. And the more you mess uh, with them, the less reliable they will be. I agree. So I'm coming into a kind of a rough area and there's a ton of traffic here. So I, I'm afraid I am going to have to kind of sign out. Um, I'm hey, in Connecticut no right now. And it's, I'm going to be hitting that spot where it cuts out anyway. But the dragon drawing looks good so far, man. Looks really good. Yeah, uh, hopefully I always can... good to talk dragons and uh, talk tattoos in general, man. I love it. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And I'll be hitting you up later this week and we'll get everything coordinated for uh, that other project. That sounds perfect, man. I'm looking forward to it, Jason. Have a good day. You too, man. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, Bill Canale did a podcast on whip shaded and faded. Excellent uh, insight into his workflow and how he is so fast. Absolutely. Um, but that's kind of the thing that you find with a lot of different tattooers that have been doing it for a long, long time is they are efficient. You know, they are insanely efficient to the point that they can knock out massive projects in like a quarter of the time that most other artists would. And part of the reason why is because they've been doing it for so long. They've streamlined their process. You know, they've cut out all of the excess stuff that, you know, makes them work a lot slower, or do a lot less stuff and, you know, get a lot less accomplished over time. So it, a lot of it comes down to efficiency. How efficient are these artists working? A lot of them, in my opinion, personal opinion here, a lot of these artists that are knocking out incredible pieces super fast, it's because they already know, ex they've already done all of the problem solving. They've already done all of the, the um, you know, where do I want my light source to be coming from? How do I want this to look? How do I want that to look? You know, how do I want this to flow with that? You know, they've eliminated that. They, because they already know in their mind exactly how it's going to look. You know, sometimes you'll find artists that'll do like a value study beforehand. Sometimes you'll find artists that do, you know, all types of different, you know, methodologies. Some will do a full color rendering before they ever put needle to skin. More power to them. Um, you know, that's not necessarily the way that I would do it, but, you know, by all means, do whatever it is you need to do to make you more efficient. Um, and that's essentially what these artists are doing, is they're working in such an efficient manner that um, they can go through and accomplish a lot more than the average artist. You know, it's kind of like why... Um, you know, you'll see some artists that'll sit down and they'll say, oh, okay, cool. I'm doing, you know, this dragon piece, right? 
well, my goal for this dragon that I'm sketching out now is to actually go through, have a fi not just a finalized line drawing, but I want to have a finalized value study done. That way I don't have to think about where are my highlights, where are my shadows, where's, you know, this ridge, where's this muscle structure going to be? That's already done, you know? Figure that out in, in advance. And yeah, you can knock out, you know, crazy amounts of work a lot faster. You know, that's just kind of the nature of the beast. You know, efficiency is everything. It really, really, really is. Um, and if you're going for maximum efficiency, you'd be surprised at how much work you can get done in a very, very short period of time. You know, but once again, that involves putting in a lot more time on the outside and not just kind of, you know, I don't want to say winging it, but, you know, it, it requires a lot more forethought into what you're doing and how you're doing it. You know, what are you going to use? If you have a standard set of liners out, right, that you use on just about every tattoo that you do, well, that's one way to streamline your efficiency, right? Because you already know you're going to use, say, a three liner, uh, a three, a seven, and an 11 liner with a seven, 11, and 15 mag, right? For every tattoo. Great. Awesome. Well, you've already eliminated a lot of your choices and a lot of your, a, a, a lot of the guesswork that goes into that. And it's like, oh, if this is a thin line, it's going to be a three. If it's a medium line, it's going to be a seven. If it's a big line, it's going to be an 11 or 14. You know, um, maybe you're going to cut out that middle line and you're going to go for ultimate line weight contrast and you're going to use nothing but a three and a 14. Cool. Great. That's going to give you a different look, but you already know that. You figured that out in advance, you know, and that's kind of, it's one thing that I always try to push myself to be a bit better with is figure all of that out before I ever touch the skin because it's just one less thing I want to think about. And I just want to think about sitting down and executing the best tattoo I possibly can. So. Yeah, but watching watching some of these guys work is just it's a it's mesmerizing. You know, you're sitting down and you're watching Bill Canales knock out a dragon and you know, maybe it's freehand and he doesn't really have too much there. Maybe it's like a couple of directional lines or something and you literally see it getting developed in front of you and it's just to me it's a magical experience. It really is. And I hate to kind of say that in that way, but it really is. And you see the same thing when it comes down to a lot of other guys that do a lot of the same subject matter over and over and over again. You know, they already know these things. So it, it is very quick and efficient. So, you know, and these are the people that I love to sit back and learn from. And I love to sit back and say, cool, how did this person do this so quickly? You know, Bill can knock out a dragon sleeve. Obviously, no, not a cover-up or anything, but he can knock out a dragon sleeve in, what, six to eight hours in black and gray? Full sleeve, which is almost unheard of. Um, I say almost unheard of because, yes, there are certain artists out there that can do that very easily without even really batting an eye. Um, but, you know, it's, once again, it comes down to experience and it comes down to efficiency. You know, that's why I like to take, especially for projects I'm a lot more passionate about, I like to take my time and really work on them in advance really make sure that I'm going to be putting out the best quality I possibly can, you know, 
am figuring out all of these problems like, oh, do I want to do the light source from this side or that side? How big do I want this line to be? How big do I want that line to be? You know, do I want to give this like a little bit more of like a jagged line or a smooth line? Um, you know, do I want to stylize this part or do I want to go through and uh, just keep everything like the same line weight and just keep it a bit more on the traditional side? You know, there's these are all things I'm trying to work out before I ever have that person come in and sit in the chair. You know, and I've noticed that with a lot of different people. Um, look at different guys, like different Canadian artists. You know, I, I may end up talking a lot about uh, the Tex family, for example, um, up at Deadly Tattoos. These guys will sit down and they'll do full value renderings of everything before they ever touch the skin. You know, they might be sketching out something for a back piece or bodysuit or whatever. But they're sitting down and they've got a fully rendered drawing. And then they'll go through and they'll create the line drawing off of that fully rendered drawing. You know, which if you already have your fully rendered drawing, boom, there you go. It's all you need. You know, you've already figured out where is your light source? Where is your, what's your color palette going to be like? What, um, you know, where are your, going to be your darkest darks and where's going to be your light your light highlights um you know you've already figured all of that out oh dragon claws how do i want this guy to look Cock this finger back. Come on. This is a point. Go through and do some rough value ovals, kind of mark that up and see how thick I want this to be. Make it a little bit thicker in certain spots to mimic the joints. Boom. There's my knuckle joint. There's my knuckle joint. There's my knuckle joint. Knuckle, knuckle, knuckle. Yeah, always good to have you on here, Jerry. It's been a while since I've talked to you. Hope you're doing well. Um, hope life is going well for you. Sky back under.
Oh, thank you, Creatures Cave. Everyone's got their own way that they like to draw dragon claws and all that stuff. Just get fine. Now for the next one, this guy down here, a little bit of a different method, three knuckle joints. First, figure out knuckle, 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 knuckle. Go through once I get all of this roughed in, then go through in the next layer up, find everything, and just make sure that I like the way it looks. Small, big, small, big. Just through. Okay. These guys in there. Cool. This way. Um, I always find that mapping out your knuckle joints first can always be beneficial. Um, sometimes I do do that and sometimes I completely forget to do that and it's times that I struggle with dragon claws that typically speaking, I'm not mapping knuckle joints. So if you want like a surefire way to go through and make sure that those are going to look good, map them out. Just do like a little circle where you want those, those joints to be, make sure that they follow in the same kind of an arc. You know, have your three rows makes things a lot easier. So 
this part. It's actually going to be curled in a bit more because most of it's going to be hidden by the body, which means you can't see a lot of it. Although, now that I think about it and I'm looking at it, I have this here. This should be bumped out. If you guys have any questions at any point in time, please, by all means, feel free to let me know. Um, always down to answer any questions you may have. Cool. Nope, was that on the wrong wire? I think it was. Blair. Just kidding. Now that I'm thinking about it, I may want do something a little bit different with this guy. Um, so this is actually going to be a tattoo. This is just one of a couple of different versions that I've drawn. Um, uh, during my consultation with the client, I was talking to them and discussing with them different ideas and different concepts about uh, they wanted something that goes from slightly above their hip to probably like mid thigh. Um, and they originally wanted like a full body dragon. And I was trying to talk to them and let them know that, hey, maybe it might be a better idea if we go through and do like the upper body alone, right? With maybe some like wind sweeps and some cherry blossom petals or whatever. Um, but I wanted to draw up both versions to kind of let them pick. Um, if they decide to go with this one, that's fine. It's going to be a lot more simplified if we go with one of the other versions that I have drawn. And like I've been, if you look at my gallery, so like dragon, 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 there's another one. You know, these are all different dragons that I've kind of gone through and sketched up different body positions, different arm and leg positions. You know, if we look at this one, this one's kind of got, you know, a leg hidden back there with like just the claws visible over there. And then this one's over here with like the foot and the hands. This one's definitely got a lot more movement coming up into the left. Um, this one's got a little bit more of a tilted head. Um, and I'm not really too crazy about this arm, but I do like this leg. You know, so this one's kind of got that upward movement going for it a little bit more. Probably won't finalize all of these. I'll probably only finalize something like this one. Um, though I do, 
I do like the leg on that other one. So I might actually just copy that layer over. But for anyone that's, you know, kind of asking or interested, yeah, it's for a tattoo. Um, you know, this tattoo isn't coming in for several months, but, you know, it's still, um, I still always like to get a head start on these kinds of things just so that that way I can really know that I'm going to knock it out of the park. Um, and I'll even do different versions of different things. Like this is all like leg portions and arm portions. I think this is the upper arms, which I really like. Put those out there. This is all like lower leg stuff. We'll group that. And if I don't like that and I want to do, say I want to move the legs up a little bit, well, I start sketching all over again, you know, until I've got something that I'm concrete on, that I'm really stoked about, that I really want to do, you know, it's definitely going to, I know at that point in time, if I'm stoked on it and I'm really excited to do it, then it doesn't matter which version they go with, I'm going to be really excited to do it. So it's just something that I enjoy doing. Um, and it's something that has always been kind of challenging to me because, you know, I've always kind of struggled with anatomy of different things and getting proportions right and perspectives right and angles right and thinking about different anatomical structures, even if it's not for a dragon. So I was drawing like a dog right? Figuring out that dog anatomy, right? For in three dimensions to know what shapes go where and how different shapes work together. That's something that it's always been a challenge for me. So I try to go through and work on that as much as I possibly can. Um, that way I know everything's going to look right. And I don't have to worry about anything, you know, looking skewed or looking off. Um, so it's just a little bit of extra effort that I like to put in that I really think helps set me apart. And it might be, uh, you know, overkill. Some people have told me that I'm putting way too much effort into this kind of stuff. Um, once again, it's something I like to do because I, I think it helps set me apart. And it helps me understand the subject matter better so that I can go through. And even if part of my stencil isn't there, it's like, oh, I don't have to worry about it. You know, oh, say like one of the tips of these claws didn't transfer over when I was doing my stencil. That's okay. I'll draw that right back in. Not a problem. Why? Because I've already understood the anatomy to such an, a point that if I have to draw parts of it in, I can do it without blinking an eye and makes the whole process a lot easier. You know, once again, problem solved. Um, trying to figure out all of my potential issues and problems before they ever arise. And there's always going to be one or two little things that may crop up that might be, that might pose a bit more of a challenge. But, you know, if I can eliminate certain variables, then I definitely will. It's like a motto of my life. Control your variables. If I wanted to do a back view of this leg, maybe have this leg coming down in this direction. It's a good question, Mike. Good question. Closer to the viewer. That and I like drawing dragons. Why not? Japanese dragons are a lot of fun to draw and they can be very, very intricate and very, very time consuming. And time consuming stuff means my hands are busy for a lot longer. And if they're busy, then that means that 
you know, I'm not sitting around idle and I'm making progress. That's my two cents and I'm sticking to it. This one, how do I want this one? Hmm. So I've got that by there. This one here. You know, just kind of roughing in my image shapes and angles and stuff like that. And rough it in first. Mm, too similar to that guy. Let's do something different with this one. Let's have... Lower leg. Uh, here. Other one here. This guy can come down. Put this one. Can't really do that over here too much. Maybe what I do instead is if I did if I did this. Go through with this one. And sometimes you got to draw parts of different things multiple times until you can get it right. Sketching and learning about it and figuring it all out is part of the fun of drawing stuff that you don't usually get to draw. That's why I like to take on all different types of subject matter. It's like, gives me a chance to sharpen my skills with stuff I don't usually do. But we'll give this another few minutes of me sketching and doodling and all that stuff. And then I'll probably sign off for the day. So if anyone else has any questions, let me know. Um, if you don't have any questions, um, that's totally fine. This is just kind of like, me trying to figure stuff out today. This. This whole piece. Some of that volume. Feel. Just given this a couple of directional lines. Knuckle. 
Another scroll be blocked by the finger itself. So I have a little bit of webbing, webbing. These are obviously just rough sketches as I go through and work on them and refine them a bit more. Um, that's when I start to add in a lot more of the detail and a lot more of like the little finesse kind of things. Little ridges and scaling and plating. You know, little accent, muscle accent lines to different things. Um, Accent line. There's one leg. I want to check the proportions and make sure that this leg isn't bigger than one of these arms. It seems to be pretty decent. Great. Well, thank you guys for joining me today. Um, Put this aside, switch back over here. Thank you for joining me today. Um, as always, if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to email management at reinventingthetattoo.com or you can send me a direct message um, and you can just look right up here, my Instagram. Feel free to send me a direct message. Give me a like, give me a follow. If you have any questions or concerns or you want me to talk about anything during the next episode, I'll be happy to do so. Um, yeah, until next time, uh, next Sunday at 1 p.m., uh, we have episode 112. Uh, so thank you very much. And hopefully I get to see all of you again during uh, next Sunday's episode.